Hello everyone, I'm back with another intricate one. In this video, we're going to again be doing time-independent quantum mechanical perturbation theory, but this time we're going to be handling the degenerate case. And as I often do with very intricate videos, I've typed out a lot of what I'm going to say, partly to add redundancy in how the information is communicated to you, increasing clarity, but it also helps keep the recording process reasonable for me. Anyway, let's get into it. In a previous video, we covered the non-degenerate case, there's a link to that video in the description. In that video we looked at two different ways of carrying out a perturbative expansion that ultimately gave the same perturbative correction formulas. For the perturbed energy eigenvalues we obtained the following results for the first, second, and arbitrary order case, this probably being the most famous equation from quantum mechanical perturbation theory. And for the states we got these two formulas for the first and second order corrections and then this result for the arbitrary order case. The key problem that we noticed in that video when considering the possibility of an energy eigenspectrum with degeneracy, which usually results from some symmetry in the problem, is the divergence of the energy denominators, which riddle all of these formulas. Only if all of the corresponding VNN quantities turned out to be zero would we possibly be able to avoid trouble, and there really isn't anything guaranteeing this. So we're going to have to actually get creative. It turns out there's actually another subtler problem. In many cases, we'll find that the perturbation will actually break the degeneracy, either partially or completely. It may even break the degeneracy incrementally with progressively higher orders, although that's not the most important fact just yet. This breaking of the degeneracy by the perturbation makes for an ambiguity. Because of the lack of an energy eigenvalue distinction between the degenerate unperturbed state, it's ambiguous what linear combination actually corresponds to the lambda equals zero limit of the no longer degenerate perturbed energy eigenstates, or at least partially no longer degenerate. The first thought one might have on this matter is that the correct linear combination of unperturbed states is the one that diagonalizes V M M prime. This way one avoids vanishing energy denominators. This does actually turn out to be correct, but of course we need to show it we have to develop a new power expansion that doesn't have the problems of the old one. This new power expansion will come from rearranging the perturbed Schrodinger equation in a different way. And much like when we worked through the Rayleigh-Schrodinger equation of the non-degenerate perturbation theory, the individual steps in this rewrite might seem a bit strange at first, but do get us to a good place. Before we can actually do the rewrite, though, we need to set up some notation. In this treatment, we'll assume a single default degeneracy. Separate degeneracies that might show up can be handled in exactly the same way, so this assumption loses us no generality. I will be using a lowercase d as my index within the degenerate subspace. Therefore, since I will continue using the notation from my non-degenerate perturbation theory video for a general unperturbed state, an unperturbed state specifically within the degenerate subspace will look like this. As I already explained, given the ambiguity of the degenerate subspace, the zeroth order states that are generated by taking the lambda equals zero limit aren't necessarily this set. In general, the specific energy corrections will correspond to linear combinations of them, which I will denote with a lowercase p or a lowercase q or primed variance as I come across the need for indices that refer to those same sets but vary independently. With this notation, we can then make a more mathematical statement of the state ambiguity that I was talking about before. Specifically, it can be stated as needing to find this set of inner products, which shows up in the usual transfer information for a change of basis. I will also use the same letters as established up here to index the corresponding unperturbed states, so like this for example, and their energy eigenvalues and correction terms. Additionally, we'll use the fact that the complete set of unperturbed states are a complete basis, allowing us to expand these perturbed degenerate states in them regardless of what form they take. It's important to note that it will in general have contributions outside of the degenerate subset because it's been perturbed. And finally, our analysis in this video will be restricted to just calculating the perturbed states and energy eigenvalues associated with them within the degenerate degenerate subset because perturbation theory functions normally outside the degenerate subspace. From here, we can finally get started with the aforementioned rewrite of the Schrodinger equation. The basic idea of the rewrite is to use projection operators to break the perturbed Schrodinger equation into two. 
one that primarily deals with the non-degenerate component of this perturbation, so the states that contribute to it outside of this D0 subset, and another one that gives us the degenerate components. It turns out that we can extract from these broken apart equations a set of first order correction formulas that don't require our previous non-degeneracy assumption. Let's define the required projection operators. First, we have one that projects onto the degenerate subspace. It's no more specific than that, that I've denoted PD. And then we have the one that's orthogonal to that. It projects onto the rest of the states, the non-degenerate ones. Naturally, they satisfy the usual properties of projection operators. Now we can actually carry out the rewrite. So we start with the perturbed Schrodinger equation, we rewrite it like this, introduce this sum of the projection operators, which is just equal to the identity, and then we distribute. You'll notice that I applied the fact that EP and ED are the same because the P0 and D0 states just differ by a change of basis within the degenerate subspace. Now we can split this into the two equations as I was talking about by applying the projection operators again from the left. If we apply PD from the left and work out a little simple algebra, we get down to here, but this actually isn't as simple as we can get it. We can see that PD and therefore also P perpendicular commute with H0. It's a pretty simple exercise to show that when we apply PD in one order with the Hamiltonian versus the other order, we get the same result. And then, of course, you can write P perpendicular in terms of PD using the usual formula up here, and so necessarily it commutes as well. That allows us to pull this PD through the Hamiltonian there, which gets rid of this term entirely. So this is the first equation that we can split the perturbed Schrodinger equation into using the projection operators, but actually we won't directly expand this one. There actually is one more algebraic modification that we will carry out before we get to the expansion stage. Applying the other projection operator to the Schrodinger equation and working it down gets us to here. We can, however, actually rearrange this a little bit more conveniently it turns out that this operator here, or more specifically this one, is not singular in the degenerate subspace. This is clear because the perturbed energy eigenvalues are close to the unperturbed one, and the eigenspectrum of this projected non-degenerate Hamiltonian has no eigenvalues equal to the degenerate energy eigenvalue. That allows us to invert it like that and arrive at this final equation. This is one that we will expand. Now the one modification that we need to make to the first one in order to get the form of it that we're actually going to expand is simply to substitute this in, which gets us to this equation. It's actually 3 and 4 that we're going to insert the Taylor expansions into to get the perturbative correction formulas. In this process, we do just insert all the required Taylor expansions and then collect terms of like order. In that sense, the usual degenerate quantum mechanical perturbation theory is actually more similar to the quick and dirty method from my non-degenerate perturbation theory video than it is to the formal expansion method, the Rayleigh-Schrodinger method, which was iterative. If you remember, however, the Rayleigh-Schrodinger method being iterative made it easy to extract concise general order formulas from it, which we can't easily do for the degenerate case, at least not with this standard method that I'm presenting you here, which you see in most of the textbooks. Regardless, let's see what we find by expanding 3 to linear order in lambda. It's quite obvious that we're going to have to tailor expand this fraction in order to see what the first order terms actually are. Fortunately, that tailor expansion isn't that insane to do, and we see relatively surprisingly that we can only include the zeroth order term if we want the equation expanded to the linear order. We can then do some useful algebra. We already know that this is the case, and for well-behaved functions of f, that implies that this is the case, which gets this projection operator conveniently through, and so since they're projection operators, they square to just a single factor of the projection operator. And now all we need to do is insert the expansion for the states, and then ignore terms higher than linear. We find that if we multiply this through, it annihilates that on contact, and we arrive at this equation which is the non-degenerate part of the first order state correction. So we found something useful from expanding that first equation already. We can get it into a more useful form by adding in some identities there, and working it down a little bit gets us a formula that's actually pretty close to the familiar one from non-degenerate perturbation theory. Note that we get this restriction on the indices from this projection operator acting to the left. We still don't know how to
to write these in terms of the standard basis states, so we can't exactly use this directly as is, but we will get there from the formulas that we get from expanding the other equation. And with that, let's now expand equation number four to linear order. Again, we're going to have to do a Taylor expansion, and what that reveals is that none of these terms are low enough order to actually allow this entire term to survive. So the equation simplifies down dramatically just from that. We can then insert the energy and state expansions, and again, just keep the linear order terms, and that gets us down to here. Again, we can usefully insert identities like this, and then also remember that P not only has contributions from the degenerate subspace, leaving us with another restriction there. If we then take an inner product from the left, we get a nice eigenvalue problem here. We see that the energy eigenvalues are the solution to this very standard characteristic polynomial here. They're just the eigenvalues of this matrix here, and we see that the coefficients that we needed to calculate to resolve that state ambiguity are just the eigenvectors. And with that, we can also use that first formula we got from expanding equation number three to linear order, because the only missing information we needed to do that was, again, these coefficients. So in short, we have reduced calculating the first order corrections to the energy eigenvalues and resolving the state ambiguity to just diagonalizing this matrix. With that, to complete our study at the first order, all we need to do is extract the other part of the first order state correction. To extract that, we need to expand equation 4 to second order, because only then will the degenerate part of the first order correction be included in the equation at all. Again, we pull out our trusty Taylor expansion of this fractional quantity, and we see that we can actually save this term, but only with the zeroth order term of the Taylor expansion of the fraction, otherwise it gets to too high order. We can then also insert the energy and state expansions to quadratic order and multiply it out, keeping only second order terms because that gives us what we need and the equation is valid order by order. So basically we're justified in ignoring the linear and any zeroth order terms that show up even though they're technically bigger than the quadratic order ones. That gets us to here. We immediately see that there's a second order energy correction term. That's a problem because we don't already know it. But because it multiplies this quantity, it's tempting to just hit the whole equation with a projection operator that projects out this specific state to eliminate that term conveniently. But we need a system of equations that fixes all components of the quantity we're trying to solve for. And in case you've forgotten by components, I'm referencing the fact that we're expanding this in the unperturbed states. The key thing being that the projection would lessen the number of equations we have by one less than the number we technically need to fix all the components that could potentially be in here. Fortunately, we can show that by selecting the usual perturbative normalization condition, this one, we can actually show that this quantity here, the first order correction, can't contain a component in this direction. Let's see how this works. If we start by writing out the unusual perturbative normalization convention, and then expand out a little bit, inserting the unperturbed normalization convention, we see that we can subtract one from both sides and arrive at this equation, which has to be valid for all lambda, meaning that none of these correction terms can actually have a component in the p naught direction, which in turn guarantees that it's true for this quantity that we're actually trying to solve for, and that resolves the problem. Therefore, we can project out that E2 term without losing any information. The projection operator we need is no surprise. Applying it gets us this equation. If we now explicitly introduce the aforementioned expansion of this quantity in terms of the unperturbed states, we arrive immediately here. We can then solve for these coefficients by taking an inner product from the left with more unperturbed states, again in the correct basis rather than the initial basis. That leaves us with this equation. We get this Kronecker delta and this other Kronecker delta, which allows us to do one sum on each side, leaving us with something that looks a lot easier to handle. If we distribute the sum through, we arrive at a term where we have another Kronecker delta, which allows us to do the only sum remaining in that one. However, this term looks a bit more complicated, but that's actually deceptive. Because remember, these projection operators just disappear, given that we're in the degenerate subspace with these two states, and we end up with this quantity here. But this matrix is diagonal in the proper basis, which means we know exactly what it is, it's just the first order energy corrections. So 
we have that result. Inserting that back in, we do have a Kronecker delta that allows us to do that last sum, leaving us with a much simpler equation, and more importantly, one that directly gives us a formula for these c coefficients. Inserting that back into our expansion of the states gets us the final answer we want. With this, we have all of the first order correction pieces, but there actually is one modification we can carry out on this in order to make it a more practically usable formula, and that's simply the introduction of some identities, as so often helps in this type of problem. Using straightforward algebra and remembering to apply the projection operators, we get this result, which along with the other two that we got is one of the most famous results in degenerate quantum mechanical time-independent perturbation theory. There is something to note here. While we don't need to assume no degeneracy in the unperturbed spectrum, we do have this new kind of energy denominator showing up there. So much like when we saw that our original perturbation theory didn't work for degenerate cases, we see that this new expansion doesn't work if the degeneracy isn't completely lifted by the first order correction. Now this might seem like a bit of a disappointment, but it's not quite as bad as you think. In the majority of problems, the degeneracy is completely lifted by the first order correction. In this case, there is no remaining degeneracies to invalidate the process that we developed in the non-degenerate perturbation theory video, so we can conveniently just continue with that. In situations where there is degeneracy left after first order, there is still nothing wrong with these ideas for the non-degenerate part of the spectrum. However, for the degenerate part, one must perform the above process again for this new, probably reduced, degenerate subspace is left over. Usually it's reduced because even when the first order correction doesn't completely break the degeneracy, it often at least breaks some of it. As long as there is degeneracy left, repeating the process that I've shown you here is necessary. If and when it is all gone, one can revert back to the non-degenerate perturbation theory at that point. And of course, that makes things much easier. And with that, we have finished covering all of the basics of time-independent degenerate quantum mechanical perturbation theory. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.